Welcome back. You're watching the All New Village Square Africa. I'm Kemini Amano. Now, about 27 years ago, President Kufuado of Ghana was one of the stars of the original Kumi Preko demonstration. It was at a time protesters held similar views of the country's economy as the high cost of living and the introduction of value added tax by the then Jerry John Rawlins administration were the issues of concern to protesters. Now, while this isn't, to the best of my knowledge, a revenge demonstration it was organized on the back of similar concerns and after a presidential address that was overshadowed by what critics say was the president's failure to understand the plight of the Ghanaian people now during the address the president flayed his critics for speculating about the downfall of the Ghanaian currency the city President Takufuado said money hates noise, a statement that generated debate in the country's media space for a while. But over the weekend, the noise was resounding as the country's people poured onto the streets to demand that he, together with his vice president and finance minister, step aside for more efficient people to lead the country. On the program, we ask, will the president resign? And really, what does it take for his removal? I introduced my guests on the program uh, today. First, I have the former CEO of the Ghana Free Zones Authority, Kwejo Chum uh, Boafo. I also have the uh, Member of Parliament for Old Tafo Constituency, Vincent Eko Asifwa. And then we have the D&D &D Fellow on Public Health at the Center for Democratic Development, Ghana, uh, Kwame Sapong Siedu. Dr. Siedu is also one of the leading concerned Ghanaians who put together the demonstration. Now, my understanding, my understanding is that our other two guests uh, currently not on our Zoom uh, call. We will fix that and bring them back into the conversation. But let's start with uh, the organizer of the protest. Thank you so much for your time here, Dr. Siedu. Uh, thank you for having me on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, let's start from the beginning. What are the reasons for the demonstration? Well, everyone knows that um, the whole world is going through austerity. It's not something that anyone can run away from. That said, <clears throat> countries are being affected differently, and countries are putting in mitigation to try and cushion the effect of the global austerity on their citizens. If you look, that seems not to be trickling down in Ghana. The cost of living seems to go up and up and up. Inflation is on the rise. The city is depreciating rapidly. And the Bank of Ghana is increasing its base rate, which means that cost of business is also going up. More importantly, unemployment is on the rise. Then what do we see? We see a president who seems to be detached from the citizenry, from a point of view of all what is going on. And if you look at our constitution, if you vote for a president, the president is given a four-year mandate, four-year term. Mm -hmm. And so the question you ask yourself is, do you just allow the system to run up to the four-year limit, or are they reproofs in the that constitution that allows uh, the president to be put on move. There are uh, what you call options in the constitution where the president can resign if he thinks that he cannot deliver his mandate. And there is a clear succession plan. Should the president be, say, permanently incapacitated, should he pass away or should he resign? So that is the, that there's the option for parliament to take a decision that the president is not performing to the oath that he swore to protect the integrity of the citizenry, and therefore this country will be better off without him. So once these two things are there, then the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the felt experience of the average Ghanaian when it comes to a current business climate? And you can hear the noise all over. You can hear it from the point of view of cost of transportation. You can hear it from the point of view of cost of food. You can hear it from the point of view of cost of fuel. And these are the things that came together. So a number of us started having discussions about what can be done. 
And the conclusion was the president should be put on notice. He either ups his game to ensure that the citizen will get value for money from the service he's providing to us. Because don't forget, we employ him. We are his employers. That's why we go to the ballot to vote. We only give him custody of power to vest in our, in our name. And if that is not happening, then as board members of Ghana Incorporated, we have every right to put him on notice. And that was why the demonstration was organized. Very well. I, I'll take it to Kwejo now. Uh, the, the opposition NDC um, has made similar calls in, in the past in regards to how things were going in the country. When you look at the numbers that turned out for the demonstration over the weekend, what does it tell you about the state of mind of the Ghanaian people? Um, if you talk about the state of mind, I would Could you, we, we, we don't have your audio. Could you adjust and, and let us hear you properly? Well, while Kujo is adjusting his audio, Doc, let me come back to you uh, with some of the things that you have mentioned and the kind of responses that we are hearing um, from the, the ruling side. We've had responses such as the fact that, well, the president has addressed a number of the things that you are mentioning in his recent uh, address to the, to the nation, and perhaps this demonstration was not important. Well, what has he addressed is the question you have to ask. If you look on uh, what you call all trading dashboards, today is Monday, the city has started declining again. It's declining against the dollar, it's declining against the pound, it's declining against the euro. Teachers are on strike as we speak, and so are some lecturers. Fuel prices are on the rise. At this point, as I speak to you, the average cost of a liter of petrol is higher than the daily minimum wage. That means a section of the population are actually cut off from commuting because they just can't afford it. The president came to us with what I call a 12-point wish list, none of which was concretized to let us know that this is what's going to happen at what time and what would be the numbers or actions that we should be judged with. So it's very easy coming to sit or stand in front of the nation and deliver a speech. But when people's lived experiences do not improve based on the speech you gave, then to tell me that you are spoken to address some of these things is not good enough. We didn't vote for a president to come and address us. We came, we voted for a president to solve our problems. The question is, after speaking, have, has the lot of Ghanaians improved or is it getting worse? That is what they should be addressing, Very not well. the fact that he has spoken. Very well, now let's, let's talk to Kwejo now. Kwejo, if you can hear me. Uh, well, my understanding is that Kwejo is not here at the moment. So we'll move on with the conversation with uh, Dr. Siedu. Now, Dr. Siedu is one of the concerned Ghanaians who called for uh, the demonstration. Dr. Siedu, let's look, at, let's look at some of the things that the president had spoken about in that address that, you know, was overshadowed by his mantra. First, um, he talked about the uh, fact that... Um, his government is doing all it can um, with particular emphasis on the IMF um, negotiations going on right now uh, between the Bretton Woods Institution and uh, the government of Ghana. Does that give you hope that things could turn around uh, sometime soon? Well, on the contrary, it doesn't. And why doesn't it? We have clear laws in Ghana which say that the budget for next year should be read by the 15th of November. We are having indications that that will have to be postponed because there's no end in sight for the IMF program. So, come the 15th, we will not have indicated numbers for the next financial year. How can that be a solution to the problem we find ourselves in? And if you look at other countries, like Zambia, the negotiations lasted up to two years. Are we going to have to postpone our budget for two years? 
we need time lines. And that was what I was saying earlier when you asked your previous question, that we want indicative timelines as to why, how these things are going to work, not just rhetoric. Like things like you said that his rhetoric like uh, money doesn't like most and all that. That's rhetoric. That's sloganeering. That is not what we need at this point in time. We actually need leadership. So the things you are asking me, none of it points to indicative actions that are benefiting the average government. One of the calls that uh, demonstrators have made is for the president to cut down the size of his, his government. On the contrary, the president has called for a 30% salary slash for um, the executive and members of his, of his government. Does that work? Well, that 30% had been in place even before things got this bad, even though some of us knew that we were on a downward that. It hasn't helped to address the situation. If it has been there all this while and hasn't, how can it be the policy now that we are at the very bottom? And you see, we need to put a lot of these things in context. I don't know if you realize that Fitch have released a statement today to say that there's a likelihood, a 50% likelihood that Ghana will default on its debt. Indeed. And saying that the longer the IMF program uh, discussion goes on, and the higher the chance that Ghana will have to restructure its debt becomes, the higher the likelihood that we would default. That's after the president's speech. And Fitch is not Ghanaian. It's a global institution. And you know the markets and these global rating agencies base a lot of the analysis on confidence. That's what Fitch has released today. Show an institution, a rating agency that has confidence in what the president delivered. The answer is no. And so we shouldn't be kidding ourselves and thinking that we can play these things and wash them under the carpet. It's not going to happen. We need to be honest and say, are the actions the president is taking impacting positively on the situation we find ourselves in? And I can answer that on a colloquial and say, no, that's not happening. Very well. Now, let's welcome back to the show Vincent Eko Asifwa. He is the Member of Parliament for Old Tafu constituency, and he's also a member of the ruling NPP in Ghana. Uh, Vincent, welcome back to the program. Now, we've, we've been talking about the concerns of the demonstrators, and so uh, let me throw that to you. Are these concerns justified enough to ask for the resignation of the president? Well, let me say a very good afternoon to you too, and to your Chinese viewers. Uh, it depends on where you sit, and it depends on the lenses that you use. Um, first and foremost, democratically, I think that um, the demonstrators were apt, and they were right within the laws and the ambit of Ghana, uh, the ambit of the laws of Ghana. Um, secondly, uh, I also feel that even though it is agreeable, and, uh, I think there is some amount of unanimity um, in terms of the two major political divides as to the difficulties that we are facing as a nation. The last time His Excellency the President and now the Council of Ufua, they were addressed the nation, he agreed that indeed there are challenges and we cannot run away from that. Um, having said that, um, there should have been some triggering um, issues for us to have had the situation that we, we find ourselves in at the moment. And so, yes, they may be justifiable, but there they are always explanations to it. Let's hear some of those explanations uh, with regards to why the president should continue to be in office. Well, in terms of competence and capability, um, you, you realize that from 2017 to 2020, and in fact, uh, on the day that Parliament resumed, I was in Parliament, and I listened to the minority leader with rapt attention. And I am quoting the minority leader because of uh, where he is coming from. He, he was very clear when <clears throat> the, the majority leader raised the issue that the finance minister should resign and gave reasons why 
um, as, as, as a corpus, we have agreed that indeed the finance minister should resign. And indeed, the minority had also given an indication that um, they should, uh, they, they have given, uh, as it were, they have petitioned the speaker that there should be a vote of censure on the uh, finance minister. Mm -hmm. the, the, the minority leader was clear when he said that from 2017 to 2020, the finance minister and by extension the government have done so well, but unfortunately he cannot say the same about the finance minister and the government as we speak. What that means is that when there was no underlying difficulties or challenges that were not anticipated, i.e. COVID, um, Ukraine war, the government was doing well. But if you check the statistics from 2016, in 2016, at the time, inflationary rate was about uh, 15.4 percent. By the end of 2019, inflation has come to a single-digit inflation, proving about 9 percent. Uh, the economic growth in 2016 was about 3.4 um, percent. By the end of 2019, economic growth had been to about um, 6.3. So all the economic fund uh, fundamentals was clear that indeed there had been some amelioration or some improvement from where we took it from in 2016. However, because nobody anticipated COVID, the difficulties that we are facing may feel like a hit to the government, and uh, as it were, no nation lives in what Ghana is not an exception, or Ghana is on an island to the global economy. And clearly we've, we've, we've been hit by the COVID-19 seriously, and everybody uh, cannot, cannot run away from that fact. And so the, the reasons are that, yes, when there was no pandemic, the economy of Ghana was doing well. Our interest rates were lower, our inflationary rates were uh, at a single digit inflation. Uh, most of our economic fundamentals were doing well, uh, especially in our when the government introduced the planning for uh, food and agriculture. Most of the policies that we rolled up, don't forget, in 2017, 2020, at that time, before 2017, when most of the people in the political divide that is the NDC was talking about the fact that they cannot pay for teacher training allowances, they cannot pay for nursing training allowances. They advanced that. The economy was not strong or robust enough to be able to take care of this statutory payment, and for that matter, they will not be able to pay. The NPP government came to office in 2017, and they were able to pay for all these statutory uh, payments. As we speak, this all this pay in Vincent, uh, are you telling us that the NPP administration can only perform when all things are rosy? We are not saying that. We are only telling you that a pandemic that has hit every country across the globe, today if you go to UK, within a space of about three months, they've changed about three or four prime ministers. When, when you listen to parliamentarians from UK, some of them will tell you that Britain is broken. This is a superpower country. This is a country that sometimes Ghana even go to for some aid when Ghana is in need. And so it, it, I'm trying to tell you that we, we are having a global difficulty. And trust me, if the NPP was not in power at this time, and if it was the NDC, I'm sure that we have had a, a bigger than this well, I'll, I'll take some reactions on that when we come back from uh, this very short break. Stay with us here. You're watching Village Square Africa. This is our new airing time, 2 p.m. here on New Central uh, TV. Right now, we've been discussing uh, the issues around Ghana, the sparked mass protests over the weekend in the country's capital, Accra. We have been talking to Dr. Uh, Esiedu, who is a D and D fellow at CDD Ghana. He's also one of the leading concerned Ghanaians who um, gathered the protesters to demand the resignation of the president and two others in his government. We also have member of parliament for Old Tafel constituency, also a member of the ruling NPP, Vincent Eko. For. And joining us again is Kojo Chum Buafo. He's a former CEO of the Ghana Free Zones Authority. He's also a member of the NDC, the largest opposition party in Ghana. I'll take it uh, from you now, Kojo. 
You've had um, the convers conversation so far. Vincent has responded to some of the uh, accusations that have been leveled against the ruling uh, MPP. What are your thoughts from the opposition point of view? Well, you, you don't need, really need an opposition point of view. What you need is Vincent and his majority party's own point of view. They have demanded that the finance minister and the minister of state of, uh, at the um, finance ministry be dismissed or they have refused to work with government. This is the first time this has happened in the history of, of democracy in our country. So you don't even need to hear from me. I could go off and maybe you can ask Vincent why they are demanding, why they have marched to the president of this republic and told him that if he doesn't dismiss his own minister of finance, who by the way happens to be his first cousin, and, and his deputy, the Minister of State, um, Charles Edouard, they will not work with the president. I'll tell you how we got to uh, um, this rocky road. That pathetic um, pandemic excuse is as pathetic as it is, because this government was gifted with over $5 billion at the time of the pandemic from various sources. Um, IMF, World Bank, they dipped into Ghana's stabilization fund. The Bank of Ghana printed currency from, for them. And what they did with the money was that they spent it on pre-election bribes. They simply willy-nilly distributed it um, amongst their kids and kids, their followers. How do you know that, Kwejo? Uh, share more on that. How do, you know, how do you know so, that that funding was misused? It was misused because it was misused. Anybody who knows anything about economics knows that pandemic or no pandemic, if you were given $5 billion that you didn't expect to come into your kitty, if you used it for the right things, you would have benefited from it. The economy would have benefited from it. Tell me, if you sit in your house and somebody comes to give you a handout, a windfall, whether people in your house were ill or not, if you use it right, it will benefit your, 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 your household. What you are going to hear is that they used it to cook rice for the people. They used it to give us free water and free electricity. By the way, free water and free electricity, which they later on demanded that we should pay. As we speak now, they have put a tax on fuel called COVID-19 taxes. In fact, that tax registers twice every time you buy a gallon of fuel because they misuse the money. So now they are taxing the people of Ghana to pay it back. Now you tell me in this country, where in the world are people, citizenry, who got afflicted with any pandemic paying taxes because they got ill? Who pays taxes for getting malaria? Who pays taxes for getting high blood pressure? Who pays taxes for getting cancer? In Ghana, we are paying taxes because we got COVID. And as someone who got COVID myself, I feel extremely assaulted and insulted to pay taxes for a disease that I got that nearly took my life. But let me go back to the subject matter, which is, why are we here? This government, on the advent of winning power in 2017, have simply spent money on luxuries that Ghanaians have never, ever seen before. Our president sits in a private jet, uh, in, uh, wherever he goes, he hires a jet. Wherever he goes, he ignores the uh, presidential jet, which sits there for his use. Sometimes the presidential jet carries other people, whilst he um, hires the most luxurious Airbus from um, Germany, from France, and he runs around the world in it at our cost. This is a government whose finance minister and the very minister of state that um, the majority in parliament are demanding that he is sacked have benefited from the loans they borrowed on our behalf because their companies are the book runners for the loan. Very well. Now, is, uh, uh, let, let's talk to uh, Vincent for, for a bit. Uh, despite the COVID-19 uh, situation that hits the entire world, including Ghana. The president of Ghana said that 
it was important to protect lives because they knew how to bring back um, a collapsed economy but cannot bring back um, the, the, the lives that will be lost, rightly so. What has changed since then? Why haven't you been able to revive the economy as promised? Vincent, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Right, please go room, ahead now. Room is not or was not built in a day. After the COVID-19 pandemic, you remember the, the government through the finance ministry came to parliament and we had to approve a certain policy guidelines that the government intended to roll out so as to be able to address the challenges that was uh, as it were, uh, faced by this country when the COVID-19 pandemic befell us. Um, unfortunately, around that time, the Russia-Ukraine war also um, came to be. And so, um, as I said, uh, it is not something that we should be around the Russian um, We've shown with our records that since 2017, the NPP government, led by His Excellency Manabi Kanko Bufuado, has been a government that can indeed turn the fortunes of this country around, especially because in 2016, as I've already indicated to you, some of the economic fundamentals that we met was very, very bad. In fact, even at the manufacturing center, you were doing about uh, negative figures. Uh, of the culture, you were doing about 0.4%. I mean, all these um, sectors were improved before 2019. And so it's something that we've done before. And the data is on our side. The data supports us because at the time, from 2012 to 2016, when my brother Purdue um, was in government as a CEO, and um, these economic fundamentals were very weak, which we spoke about indeed. From 2017-2020, after we had introduced a number of policies, a number of flagship programs that needed a lot of resources, we were also uh, we were still doing well. Unfortunately for us, we were hit by COVID-19. Nobody, nobody should have played the effect of COVID-19 because Kodo Ghana is not an island. Even Britain, USA, and other big countries are talking about the impact of COVID-19. We are, we are saying that so, um, we, we shouldn't use COVID as an excuse. So I want us to talk about COVID now. Every penny um, uh, that came to Parliament, every penny that came to Parliament came in as a budget line that was supposed to be used for a specific um, um, budgetary allocation. So it cannot be that you just throw the figures around and see. Um, so I, I want us to look at COVID now. Let, let's look at those figures. Playing that oversight responsibility. Vincent, hold your horses. I want us to look at those figures. Ghana was right. one of the countries that was fortunate enough to get funding uh, during COVID 19 because of the same uh, disease. Does it bother you, right. as Member of Parliament, that till date we haven't had a concise account of how? all that money was used well this is supposed to be done by the auditor general's department and um, sometimes you know that the auditor general's department uh, may be late in some of these things but of course um we also have the public accounts committee which is also supposed to be doing this job this is a legislative arm of government's responsibility it cannot be laid at the doorstep of um, the executive because the public accounts committee it's a standing committee in parliament which is enshrined in the 2 constitution, the standing orders of parliament. Aside that, the auditor general is also having a full chapter that has been devoted to in the 2 constitution that is supposed to also do its job in terms of this um, auditing. And so these statutory um, agencies are supposed to be um, held responsible, if you like, in making sure that there's some amount of accountability. But from where I sit as a parliamentarian, every budget line that comes to parliament comes for a certain purpose. Parliament debates is that Parliament approves for what it is supposed to be used for. Um, apart from that, if I am not a member of the Public Accounts Committee, even though Parliament plays that oversight responsibility, it is the Public Accounts Committee, which is chaired by an NPC uh, member of Parliament. And so, Kodro should be able to know this. I mean, it is surprising that... Do you, are do you, do you by is, any chance know what those monies were used for? Coming it shouldn't lie in my mind. As a journalist, I'm sure that just a simple research should have reviewed everything that we have used all these money for. Of course, I did not know that we we're going to um, discuss into detail as to how all these monies were used for. But of course, this is 
these, these are documents that is parliamentary hazard that you can always find that this amount of money was secured, it was supposed to be used for this, this amount of money was secured, it was supposed to be used for testing and tracing, this amount of money was secured, it was supposed to be used for this. All these documents and information are there and in the parliamentary hazard. We are not hiding anything from anybody. And we can't well. hide it because in a simple search community, you should be able to find it. Very well. Uh, let, let, let's go to Dr. Siedu now. Dr. Siedu, we've kept you quiet for a bit now. Um, the reasons, chiefly, of the reasons that uh, Vincent has given on the program today is COVID-19, which hit uh, the entire world. Uh, from where you sit, will that suffice for you, that it will take time for the country to recover from that hit? You see, it's interesting when I listen to Vincent. And the point is, there's a reason why COVID was called a global pandemic. It affected every single country in the world. And therefore, there is a baseline from which all countries are coming. So if on the basis of that baseline, you find out that Ghana, for example, has the worst performing currency in the world, when that wasn't the case pre-COVID, it means that in the recovery, other countries have done a lot better, overtaking Ghana, leading to us dropping to the bottom of the class. That is a clear sign that the brains that are managing the economy are losing the ability to drive it. When the other countries are having people who are thinking creatively to sustain their currencies, that is a first indicator. Then you look at inflation. Globally, inflation is rising. But if you look at Africa, Ghana's inflation is inching towards what? 40% now. If you look in the West Africa sub region, there's no country that is anywhere even near 20%. So I ask myself, these countries have higher some of these countries have higher inflation rates than Ghana because pre the pandemic we were in single digits. Suddenly, there's been an acceleration whereby we've surpassed them to become one of the worst. That clearly shows me that something is not happening. You can say the same for interest rates. So what of the argument? It makes me a bit petrified because it's like telling me that as a result of the pandemic, our ability to think has been lost, and other countries have gained a foot over us, and as a result, are making a lot more advances and bettering a lot of their citizens. And you must know that when inflation goes up, when currency depreciates and cost of business goes up, it is felt by the citizenry directly. So even though inflation might be up in one country, if it's 10%, and you are in 35%, your citizens do not experience the pain equally. Likewise, even though the cost of fuel might have gone up in all countries because of COVID and the Russian Ukraine war, if you have a country where the cost of a liter, not a gallon of fuel, is higher than the daily minimum wage, the pressures are not the same. You do it contextually, and Vincent was making. Um, a comparison with a country like the EP. And yes, fuel prices have gone up in the UK. A litre of fuel is 1.69, 1.70, 1.70. But the minimum wage is almost 10 pounds. That's less than, uh, what do you call it, 10% of the minimum wage. So if you look at it, that is an hour, hours is a day. If you look at it for a day, the cost of a litre of fuel is under 2% of the daily minimum wage. How can you say the pressures that the people are experiencing, I would say? And that is why I don't buy Vincent's argument, because we can all do baseline for COVID. I am a health fellow. That is what I do for a living. I churn out the health numbers. And I can go on and on and on and debate well. with every single parameter, including the cost of food. And you realize that his argument doesn't have it. Very well. Uh, could you, uh, are you confident that this call for the resignation of the president and uh, the vice president, as well as the finance minister, will go any further than the demonstration? 
Hey, if, if you allowed me, I, I would have clarified some of the things I was saying because I feel a little Quickly. short changed here. I think um, Mr. Dr. Skidu has said something to you that's very important. This French gave you the other pathetic excuse, which is the Russia-Ukraine war. Our currency is doing worse than the very people on whom the bombs are landing. Our currency is doing worse than the people who are landing the bombs. So how do we use Russia-Ukraine as an excuse for the pathetic um, economic situation in which we find ourselves? Once again, I need you to ask Vincent, why they, the majority in parliament, have asked Kenofureta and Chase Dubwaini to be sacked? Otherwise, they wouldn't do business with Let's, them, let's, with hear, from, let's um, hear from him then. Uh, Vincent, Vincent, it's on record that the uh, ruling side in parliament has asked that the finance minister goes home. Question is why? And do we see uh, same for the president as well? I think that is an internal issue. Um, as a focus, uh, we met and about 80 MPs started this, which I was part of that 80 MPs. Uh, after when focus met, focus adopted the position of the 80 MPs, which is also an internal decision. And so I don't have the um, autonomy of my other colleagues to put the reasons um, out. But what we know is that we feel that at that juncture, we have to in, um, press on the excellency the president to ensure that um, Kenofori um, Atta is a client as the uh, finance minister, but it's a purely internal party matter uh, if you think that we're going to keep it as such. Uh, very well. Uh, Dr. Siri, I'll give you the last word on this one. Um, we know that we only need a third of parliament, about 91 members, to be able to push through something that could begin the processes for the removal of the president. Do tell us. How confident are you that this will happen? And if it doesn't, what's the next step for uh, the group? Well, you see, citizens have a right under the Constitution to protest. So if the processes don't start and the lot of the citizenry doesn't improve, then we'll continue to call for protest. It's as simple as that. So it's not about how confident we are or are. It's about the fact that at the end of it, we put people in political office to make citizens feel better. If they are not able to do that, they must leave. If they claim transigent and insist on staying, they will continue calling for um, what they call as protest. And that is our democratic right. As long as we are peaceful, <laughs> that we can be peaceful, Very well. we will continue calling for protest. I apologize, gentlemen. We would have to end our conversation on the program today. I know there's a ton to talk about, but I do appreciate your time with us here on Village Square Africa. And to you, uh, wherever you're watching us from on the continent, thank you so much for uh, your attention today. The all-new Village Square Africa comes your way Mondays through Thursdays at 2 p.m. here on New Central TV. My name is Kemini Amano. I'll see you again tomorrow, same time, right here. Goodbye.